We will be continuing through the Gospel of John after I go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it is a joyous time of the year for us. And I pray that our hearts clearly understand the reason for the season as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. This morning we have turned aside from the things of the world and I know there are a lot of things out there that could pull us away. I'm thankful for those who came out this morning, Father, even on a rainy Sunday. For those who wanted to be in your house, to fellowship one with another, and more importantly, to fellowship with you. I ask this morning, Father, as we begin to read your scripture, that your Holy Spirit would enlighten it for us, for that's the only way that we will ever really truly see everything that you have for us. And I pray for open and receptive hearts. I ask, Father, that we can put the things of the world aside for a few moments and focus squarely upon your word and what you have for us. I thank you for the salvation that comes to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you for how you've blessed us so much every single day. And yet we only turn aside one day of the year for Thanksgiving when we should thank you every single hour of every single day. Father, guide us in this time for your glory not ours that we may learn our hearts will be changed and we will move closer to our savior jesus christ and it is in jesus name we pray amen john chapter 5 this morning beginning at verse 28 a rather long portion but i don't like to skip when i read in scripture i like to read it all and so we're beginning at verse 20, I'm sorry, verse 23 of chapter 5. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me have everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of the damnation. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. He sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. But I received not testimony from man. But these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and shining light. And ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. He hath, heard, he hath neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And he hath not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent. Him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye may have life. I have I received not honor from man, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. And I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another 
and, and seek not to honor that cometh from God only. Do not think that I accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? A long portion there as the Lord responds to the religious leaders after the healing of the man by the pool of Bethesda. And they're questioning and, and they're accusing and Jesus answers. But I want to start this morning by reading again verse 25 where Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they, shall, they that hear shall live. And in verse 28 he continues, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. I want to get you thinking this morning because I want to start with a question. How can the future tense, the hour is coming, be the same as the present tense and is now? That's just, the hour is coming and is now, says Jesus. We have to be very careful. We need to explain what Jesus is talking about here. We don't want you to be confused. Is now, and I mean, we are right now living in that period, present tense. A lot of things are important in, in Scripture. Present tenses are important. When God spoke to Moses at that burning bush, He identified, I am that I am. Tell them, I am have sent thee. That is present tense. It was present tense at that bush. It's present tense today. And in a million years, when we've been in heaven that long, it will still be present tense. He is always God. He is the ever-present one. And here we need to know that this is now. Jesus makes, makes it clear that the hour has not yet arrived, but the hour is coming. So, you know, when our human thinking says, wow, how can it come and be here now? So we get a little bit perplexed and we try to come up with answers. Now, I know I probably had you pretty well confused to get started with, but let me try to explain to you in a manner that I hope you can understand. The fact of the matter is right, we are right now living in the period, the age of the dispensation, if you will. We are dispensationalists. Dispensation actually means household economy. How God is dealing with his household right now. And we know that he dealt differently with Adam than he did with Moses, and he deals differently with us than he did with David. Different dispensations. So we are actually moving to the time when the dead shall hear the voice of God, and they that hear shall live. So now let's consider this. If we live in the period that, of the hour that is to come, then what did Jesus mean when he said, is now, or now is? We need to understand who the dead are that hear his voice right now. You have to understand, we're talking two different things here. If we go over to John 11, I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but if we go over there, we find where Jesus goes to raise Lazarus from the dead. And he told Lazarus' two sisters, Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Though he were dead, Jesus says. He's comforting the, the sisters there. He's focusing their attention future. Even though he's dead, he's to live. He's telling us that the person in the grave right now hears? No. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. Here he's talking about spiritual death. That's what he's talking about now, is now, and is coming. He's talking about here spiritual death. See, death is a separation. Physical death is a separation of the soul from the body. Spiritual death means separation from God. And I'm going to tell you something. Spiritual death is far worse than physical death. Spiritual death can be eternal. You know, we're, if the Lord doesn't come back in our lifetime, we're going to die. There's no other way to say it. But as a believer, the body stays here. We've got to be with the Lord for eternity. But if you go, you die without Jesus Christ, you're spiritually dead forever. You'll stand in the great white throne. But the fact is the hour is coming when those who are in the grave shall hear His voice and live. But right now, 
when those, are, those who are spiritually dead need to hear the voice of Jesus Christ and be saved. That's what he's talking about. Jesus, yes, one day I'm going to call the dead back. But today I'm giving the word so that people who are spiritually dead can hear and, and be saved. It's been going on for 2,000 years. Well, Jesus, Jesus is here. And the word of God is here. And people proclaim the gospel. They hear the word of God and they can be saved. You know, I want to tell you the spiritual condition of everyone before they came to Jesus Christ for salvation and continues to be for those who have rejected Jesus, they're lost. They're spiritually dead. From the time that Adam sinned, he was spiritually dead until he came to know the truth. So Jesus says, how, you know, how is this possible? Jesus says, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me have everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death out of spiritual death, what he's talking about here, unto life. The life that Jesus Christ alone gives. That is the now. That was 2,000 years ago. Present tense is now. The spiritually dead can live. 2,000 years later, the spiritually dead right now can live if they will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But notice carefully, Jesus says, He that heareth and believeth on Him. That's whosoever. Anyone. No one's excluded. Pay close attention to the fact that this is not limited to those who are predestinated, predestinated or it doesn't exclude anyone. It's available to anyone who will come to faith. Just simple faith. Those who hear and respond properly, positively, and accept it. You're going to be alive today. You know, there are millions of people outside those doors all over the world today who are dead. They're dead at 4 o'clock. They're spiritually dead. They don't even realize it. So if we properly interpret the Scriptures, we see that in verses 25 and 28, Jesus is talking about two separate things. The time is now, and it's been for 2,000 years when Jesus gives spiritual life. And you know, He doesn't quit. If, the, if we're raptured out of here today, the tribulation begins tomorrow, Jesus is still there. Jesus is still calling people to salvation during the tribulation. We go into the kingdom. There are going to be children born who are going to be lost. Jesus is still present tense if they hear the gospel. And the hour is coming when Jesus will raise the dead out of the grave. That's always an amazing thing to me. We talk about the rapture of the church. and not, Let me not get ahead of myself. Then Jesus makes another incredible statement to me in verses 26 and 7. For as the Father hath life in Himself... So he hath given to the Son to have life in himself and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he's the Son of Man. That's Jesus' favorite term for himself, by the way. Did you know that? Go through the Gospel account, Son of Man. Totally man. He had to be one of us. That's why he was born in, in Bethlehem, to be one of us. He knows what we go through. He knows what we feel. He knows what it's like to be tempted. I'm going to tell you right now, he was tempted more than anyone in this room has ever been tempted. He's one of us. That's why when we go to Him in prayer, He knows what we're going through. He feels it. Our Lord Jesus Christ is a life giver. Being God, He is the life giver. You know, we're in His hand. From the moment you come to Him for salvation, you're in His hand, try to pry that hand open. You cannot open the hand of God. You're there forever. Not only does Jesus have life, He gives life. I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, he says over in John 10.10. 10. I come that they may have life. Was he talking about physical? He's talking about spiritual life there. He wants you to be born again. And being totally God, Jesus has the right to execute judgment. Remember, he came the first time, that little baby. He's not still a little baby in the manger. He's God Almighty. But he came as Savior. He didn't come to judge. But our Lord is coming again. Praise the fact that He's coming again. And this time He's going to come in to judge. At that time, the graves, those in the graves will hear His voice. 
He says, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all, keywords, all, this is important. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Probably a little better translation for the word damnation is judgment. They're going to come under judgment. So even a casual reading of these two ver verses, it gives us two different resurrections that are mentioned here. Over in the book of Revelation, you find it more specific and describes the, the completion of the first resurrection over in chapter 20 and the second revelation later in chapter 20 that ends up at the great white throne. The important point for us to hear when, when we start hearing that voice when you're in the grave, if, we're, if we have passed on, if we have gone on to glory before the rapture, He's going to call us. The first resurrection is for all those who are saved, but it doesn't happen at one time. It's all part of the first resurrection, but it doesn't happen at once. But this you know, also reminds you that this is the next event on God's prophetic calendar, the rapture of the church. Do you know that not one thing has to happen before the rapture? Not one prophecy fulfilled, which means you look for it every moment, every hour of every day. It could happen before we finish the sermon this morning. As John says, come quickly, Lord Jesus. It could happen any time. We talk about the word rapture. You know, that's a good translation of the Greek word harpezo. And it's the same word that the Apostle Paul uses over in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, when he says, we shall be caught up. That means to be raptured, to be snatched out of here. The rapture will take place sometime in the future. It could be this afternoon. It could be next month, next year. I don't know. But it's the next event to happen. And it will happen because we have the Lord's Word on it. As I said, there's no date given. Nothing has to happen first. And it's at that point, at the rapture, that Jesus is going to call His own out of the world both the living and the dead, the church. We read over 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I love this passage. For the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout and a voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's harpezo, the rapture. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so shall we ever be with the Lord. I want to tell you that I like that. The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. How did He call Lazarus back from the grave? You remember? He commanded with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. On that day, if we're in the graves, you're going to hear your name. Even though we've been with the Lord with some type of body, you're going to hear your name. You're going to go up. You're going to get a glorified body. You say, well, how can everybody hear their own name? With God, all things are possible. And the voice of the archangel. When John was on the island of Patmos, he would come up hither. Remember that? That's what the living believers at that time were going to come up here. Church, come up. And then the trump of God. You know, the three trumpets sounds in Scripture for worship, for war, end of the day. This is the trump of God for the world. It's coming. Be warned. We see in this one passage exactly what's going to happen. See, the rapture is part of the first resurrection. Keep in mind that even the tribulation period, there are going to be a great number of people who will believe. And many of those believers are going to be martyred. They're going to be killed. They're going to be in prison. They're going to be tortured. They're not part of the church. They're saved by grace through faith like everybody in history has been saved. But they're tribulation saints. They're saved though. The tribulation saints will be raised at the end of the great tribulation period when the Old Testament saints are raised. This is also part of the first resurrection. Now, all those resurrected during the first resurrection are believers. Old Testament and New Testament believers. Okay? Every one of them. 
even though it happens in different increments, it's the first resurrection. It's the resurrection of life, as Jesus Christ called it. Then there'll be another resurrection to come, and that will be the resurrection of judgment or damnation, whichever you prefer there. Those involved in that resurrection are the lost people of all history. And they will all be involved. They will all stand at the great white throne judgment. The second resurrection is when all the unsaved of every age, every dispensation, every period will be raised. You see, all those people want to be judged by their works. And they will be. Every one of those unsaved people will come before a righteous and just God. They're going to have the opportunity to stand before the holy God and plead their case, but I'm going to tell you something, they'll be speechless. You won't be able to say a word. How in the world can you stand before God and put a defense? You remember, Jesus was silent. Why? Because he was, he was standing trial for us. He didn't speak because we're guilty. How are you going to speak before God? You're guilty if you're without Jesus Christ. You know, like in every aspect of our life, God warned them to. You know, no one can plead innocence without Jesus Christ. You go out at night and you look at the stars, you know there's a Creator. You know there's a God. And if you know there's a God, you should have a heart. I want to know Him. And I'm going to tell you, if you have a heart for God, He will find you with the Gospel. You know, at the great white throne judgment, there will be no saved person. They'll be all unsaved. It is only the lost who are brought there. And they are judged according to their works. You know, you know why they're judged according to their works? Because there are different degrees of punishment. Did you know that? Luke 12 says, And that servant, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did not commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. You see, God is a God just. He's going to judge. Remember, he says, it'd be better for the death of Sodom and Gomorrah than it is for this generation. But I'm going to tell you what, there are no pleasant punishments when you're in hell. Jesus, of my own self, I can do nothing. I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. I think about this judgment. I think about the great white throne and Philippians 2.10 comes to mind that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and the things in heaven, the things of the earth, the things under the earth, everything, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Think about that. The day is coming when everyone who has been sentenced to hell is going to realize they're going to bow before Jesus Christ. They should have done it now. They should have done it in their lifetime. But they're going to realize, how would you like to go through eternity knowing you had the opportunity to be saved and now it's too late? I can do nothing of myself, Jesus says. Don't take this for weakness. The Lord isn't weak. It simply means His self-limitation when He came down to earth and took upon Himself our humanity. Jesus gave up the glory that He had in heaven, but He never stopped being God. He knew what everybody was thinking. He knew where He had to go. He knew what He had to do. He just gave up His glory. He came down as this earth as a man, not to do His own will, but the will of God. Here's a lesson for the Christian. It's an example for us today. Even though we as born again believers in Jesus Christ are saved, you and I have a will of our own, an old sin nature, and that sin nature is not obedient to God. When we allow that old sin nature to get a little foothold and starts getting control of us, 
rather than willingly submitting to the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. We can't be obedient to God because we're actually in rebellion against God. Even believers, when you let that the old spirit take control of your life, you're in rebellion against God. Without exception, that is the natural state of every person on the face of the earth. Actually, every person since Adam. This is the reason that, Nicod that Jesus told Nicodemus, ye must be born again. You have to have a new nature. You know, those who are of the flesh cannot please God. Remember back in John 3, 6, Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You and I have a new birth because we have to, our old nature is incorrigible. That old nature never quits. It tugs on you. It pulls on you. It pushes you. That old sin nature is in such rebellion against God that it has been and it continues to be the same way if you could open your spiritual eyes and look at your that old sin nature. It's carrying protest signs. It's rebelling against God right at the gates of heaven. Yep, that's inside each and every one of us. It's not a happy thought. And this protest has been going on ever since the day that man came through those gates of Eden into the world. You know, there's a standard statement, though, when you talk about this. Somebody says, prove it. You know, I didn't see it. I don't. How many times have you heard people when you're talking about that? Well, I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I don't know. I have a friend like that. He told me I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I don't. I can't believe it. He was a Marine, which that tells you your mindset. I said, "Well, you believe that the uh, Marines placed a flag on Iwo Jima? I saw it. You did. I saw a picture of it. You didn't." And he looked amazed at me. He said, "What you saw, there was a reenactment. Did you see the real flag go up?" Well, no, I didn't. Then how can you believe it? See, that's the idea that people have today. Prove it. So Jesus tells those religious leaders, that's what they're asking Him. Prove it. He says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that bears witness of me, and I know that that witness which He witnesses of me is true. Jesus, He's the Word of God. He's the living Word. And I want to tell you, he knows the scriptures. They're him. I mean, all of them, from beginning to end. And he knew that those religious leaders were well aware of the fact that in court, it took the testimony of two or three witnesses to prove a case. Jesus, as, if you go through the Gospels, Jesus is always a step ahead of these people the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, he's always ahead of them. So he said, I bear witness of myself, it doesn't mean anything. It wouldn't stand up in court if I just bear witness of myself. He said, there's another that bear witness of me. Now, with this statement, the religious leaders are thinking John the Baptist. That's in their mind. Because that's still fresh. Jesus knows their thoughts. He knows his... You know, Jesus actually isn't referring to John here, but he knows the thoughts of those religious leaders. Because he says... He sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. Even though John, Jesus is speaking of John here, he is saying that John the baptizer indeed did bear witness of him. You didn't believe him. Now, Jesus is not talking about John here. Then who is, who is the witness that he's talking about? The Lord is referring to another witness, not a human witness. And that makes two witnesses for men to recognize. But I received not testimony from man. See, Jesus isn't worried about what man says. But these things I say that you might be saved. Jesus claims a higher witness than witness of man, any man. He does give testimony. Of, yeah, John the Baptist gave testimony. If you look in your Bibles, our version says Jesus called John a light. He was a burning and shining light. If you check your Greek a little bit, a more accurate translation is lamp. 
He was a burning and shining lamp. You see, Jesus is the light. He's the light of the world. We know that. John was a witness. That is, John was his light bearer. He was a lamp, if you please. He was bearing that light. The lamp. And Jesus says, but I have a greater witness than of John. See, he's still trying to get there. Those religious leaders' mind off of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father sent me. Jesus' credentials are the miracles he performed. These men just saw that fellow who'd been there for 39 years in a bad state. Jesus healed him. They're upset because he did it on the Sabbath. Jesus says, this is my credential. I have the, the power of God to heal these people. You know, there, there are some today who have the idea that they have the power that Jesus had. And I'm going to tell you something. To me, that's blasphemy. When they claim they have this power. You see, these miracles which Jesus performed attested to who He was, who He claimed to be. He's the Messiah. He's God incarnate. Most people have the idea that Jesus' healing ministry was limited to a few isolated cases that we find in Scripture. You say, well, there's quite a few people here. Well, the Gospel accounts, I want to tell you something, are only a glimpse of Jesus Christ's ministry on earth. Just a glimpse. Somebody's going to say, well, Pastor, how do you know that? John 21, 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did that which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. How much do we not know about what Jesus did here? We're never going to know this side of glory. How many people Jesus healed. But there's one thing I do know. And that is unlike those who claim the gift of healing today, Jesus didn't put on healing services. You didn't see a big billboard coming to town soon. He never took up offerings. He didn't sell miracles. He didn't get people to stand in line and come to Him. Rather, the crowds moved in on Him. And He went out into the highways and the byways and He did so to heal people, to give them the word of salvation. They were healed for the glory of God. Everyone who was healed was a credential, a witness, a proof that Jesus Christ is who He said He was. It's a confirmation of the fact that He is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Over the years, I'm pretty sure I've called attention to Jesus' ministry of healing in the Gospels. But this, you know, there were not just a handful of miracles and healings. There were not even hundreds Jesus healed. There were probably thousands of people that Jesus healed. I mean, there were multitudes. We'll find out one day. Here's another fact to take hold of. No one, not even the religious leaders, contradicted the fact that Jesus healed. They never said He didn't do it. They found some other reason. You did it on the Sabbath. Something like that. 2,000 years later, in some musty, dusty college office, these scholars sit back and they write their books and they say, we don't believe Jesus performed any miracles. But you know what? That doesn't prove one single solitary thing except they don't believe. Jesus' miracles were His credentials. If they can destroy His miracles, these unbelievers think they can destroy Jesus. Our Lord's mighty works bore witness that the Father had sent Him. And the Father Himself, which has sent Me, hath borne witness of Me. He hath neither heard His voice at any time, nor seen His shape. And ye have not His Word abiding in you. For whom He hath sent, Him ye believe not. Search the Scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of Me. Search the Scriptures. Think of the Brian call when I hear that. Search the Scriptures. You know, I think a lot of people miss the point of search the Scriptures. Should we search the Scriptures, Pastor? Certainly you should. 
but he is talking to a direct group of people here for a purpose. It has to be understood that search the scriptures is an imperative, not an imperative, it is indicative. He is not commanding them to do this. He said, if you read them, you'll find a sign. You'll find the proof. Let me see if I can make that clear to you so you can understand what I'm trying to say. It can be understand, understood like this. Religious leaders, you search the Scriptures. He's not commanding. He's making a statement. He's urging them, search the Scriptures. And if they would search the Scriptures, they would, they've been doing it thinking they can have eternal life. They don't understand that the Scriptures, and this is what Jesus is trying to tell them, search the Scriptures, they testify of Me. That's what He's telling them. If you search the Scriptures, you're going to find out that I am who I say I am because they testified of Me. You know, you better be careful. When you read your Bible and you don't find Jesus in your Bible, something's wrong with you. He's there every page. And I, you don't find Jesus in the Scriptures... I mean, he's talking about, Jesus is talking about the Old Testament Scriptures as well as the New. Your search is in vain. Because of this lack of understanding, Jesus says, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. You've searched the Scriptures the wrong way. You're trying to work your way to salvation. They're telling you all about the Savior. Telling you all about the Messiah. The Scriptures speak of the Messiah. But the religious... Rulers were unwilling to come to Him. Just like today, millions and millions and millions of people refuse to come to Jesus Christ for salvation. They're depending on their religion. They're depending on their works. They're depending on their good deeds. And I don't know how much more to save them. Today, people just like 2,000 years ago missed the point. There's one thing about Jesus teaching and preaching. He spoke the truth he never watered down the Scripture and He never stopped to consider if it stepped on your toes or not. That's the three things you still need to do today. You speak the truth. That's the Word of God. You never water the Word of God down neither add to or take away from. And if it steps on toes, that's what it's designed to do. Jesus said in verse 42 and 43, but I know you. I know you. You could probably have a sermon on that. I know you. Which means, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're feeling. I know what you believe. I know what you don't believe. And he says, that ye have not the love of God in you. And I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Jesus knew these men rejected him. He knew those men hated him. But Jesus came in his Father's name. Basically, they didn't love God. They didn't know God. They pretended. They played a good game. But they, they were in the same condition the world is today. They did not love God. And they reject Him. But one day, Jesus says, in the future, someone's coming in His own name and you'll accept Him. Who's Jesus talking about? He's talking about the Antichrist. There have been a lot of little A Antichrists over the years. He's talking about that capital A Antichrist of the tribulation. He's going to come in His own name and you're going to accept Him. You reject the truth. They rejected Christ who came in His Father's name, yet when the Antichrist comes in His own name, makes an image of Himself, sets it up in the temple, they're going to accept Him. How can you believe which honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God? These leaders were prideful. That's a, that's a problem we all have. And they looked for the applause of men. They wanted to be patted on the back. They wanted people to bow down to them. They wanted people to say, oh, you're so wonderful. You know, that pat on the back is still a curse within churches today. Even good churches. There are teachers with itching ears wanting compliments of others rather than giving the truth of God's Word. They seek not the honor that cometh from God only. They want what's in this. You know, if you're, that's all you're after is the praise of men. Well, you've already received your rewards. Don't expect anything when you get to heaven if you're a believer. If all you want is the applause down here. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. 
there is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you, how shall you believe my words? This is important. Jesus told him, search the scriptures. They talk about me, he said. You know, how about Moses? Oh, Moses is so important. Here it is. But you didn't believe Moses. For had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me. You didn't, they didn't believe. They play the game, but they don't believe. It's important. If the books of the Pentateuch that Jesus is pointing out here, and I believe Jesus is on every page. I really believe that. The Lord clearly states, Moses wrote of me. You see, they didn't believe the Word of God. There it is. They had the pen. They had the prophets. They had all oh, the history. They had it. He said, Moses spoke of me. He's going to believe him. If you don't believe the Word of God, where are you going to go? You're going to be just like those fellows. When a man begins to make an attack on the Old Testament, watch out. A lot of people are like that. I've heard people say, well, that's the Old Testament. It's dead. It's gone. We don't need it. You better take a step away from that person. They're removing so much that is important. When they do that, they're making a very subtle attack on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm afraid there are many men who are very foolish and they begin to question the Old Testament. They don't realize at the beginning what they're doing. It's like a man in the insane asylum. He went down, he started digging out the foundation. He's digging and digging. Another man came up to him and said, why are you digging the foundation? If you dig the foundation, it's going to fall. He said, I don't worry about it. I live on the third floor. See, that's what, if you take away the, be the beginning of the Bible, you take away the Old Testament, the foundation crumbles. I don't care how far you are, you don't have the answers. Because in the old, the new is concealed. In the new, the old is revealed. It's there. It's that we need it. The Old Testament is the foundation. And if you don't believe the writings of the Old Testament, how are you going to believe the words of Jesus Christ? It's God's Word from in the beginning to come quickly, Lord Jesus, amen. It's there. They both go together. If you reject one, you're rejecting the other. If you reject the promises of the Old Testament, <coughs> how do you know that God won't reject His promises in the New? But God cannot lie. Keep His Word. Believe the Word. Believe the Word. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, there's quite a bit in this portion of Scripture and we need to know that we have to believe Your Word. If we believe Your Word, then we recognize our Savior. There's a world out there who rejects. They let that sin nature pull them in the wrong direction. And Father, we need that Holy Spirit to guide and direct. I'm asking this morning that everyone is searching their hearts. And the search is, am I saved? Not do I think I said I'm saved or I hope I'm saved, but am I saved? I'm asking that everyone here ask the question, if I died right this moment, would I be with the Lord or not? It's the most important question of a lifetime. I know there are other needs, there are physical needs, spiritual needs, family needs. Whatever the need is, Father, in these next few moments, I ask that they would turn, accept your calling, your leading, and come. I thank you, Lord, for your word and the truth of it and the salvation of Jesus Christ. It is in his wonderful name that we pray. Amen. All right, this evening at 6.30, if you can be with us, we'll be back in uh, 1 Corinthians. We weren't here last week, but we'll be back. And if I'm not mistaken, tonight's sermon is going to deal quite a bit with uh, some of the things we talked about this morning, especially the rapture, if I'm thinking correctly in my notes here. 
try to be back with us, 6.30. Wednesday evening, 5.30 for a midweek study of the Feast of the Lord. And next Sunday morning, try to be with us for Sunday school or morning service.